Hello, welcome to our immigration briefing during CHCI's Spring Policy Summit. I'm Marco Davis, President and CEO of CHCI, uh, and I'm excited to have two guests here to share with us the latest on where we are as a country in trying to uh, reform our immigration system. Joining us today is Congresswoman Linda T. Sanchez, representing California's 38th Congressional District. Congresswoman Sanchez serves as Vice Chair of the House Democratic Caucus, the fifth highest ranking position in the House Democratic leadership, uh, and she leads the Task Force on Immigration for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Uh, in fact, she and U.S. Senator Bob Menendez introduced the bicameral U.S. Citizenship, Citizenship Act of 2021, which is President Biden's uh, uh, bold, inclusive, and humane framework for the future of the United States immigration system. I'm also joined by Alida Garcia. Alida currently serves at the White House as a senior advisor on migration. She's a political strategist and immigration reform advocate. Prior to joining the White House, uh, I believe she's on leave, in fact, from Forward.us, where she served as Vice President of Advocacy, which is an advocacy organization focused on passing comprehensive immigration reforms. So please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Sanchez and Alita Garcia. How are you all doing? Great. Good to be with you. Great. Thanks. <laughs> good, good. Thank you. Glad to have you both. So why don't we start? Uh, with you, Alita, can you share just uh, briefly, what are the main features of, of the proposal that President Biden introduced? Well, I think I'm really excited to be here um, with CHCI and with Congresswoman Sanchez, because I think, as you mentioned, Marco, um, this bill was put forth a great partnership with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and with the leadership and the vision, the progressive vision of Congresswoman Sanchez and Senator Menendez. And so what we have from Senator Biden is really the most progressive um, framework put forth that um, not only focuses on a generous legalization program for the 11 million undocumented, but truly works to fully reform our immigration system and also address root causes um, that drives people's migration choices to the United States that I, I know we'll, we'll tackle later on in this conversation. That's great. That's great. And Congresswoman Sanchez, anything you would add in terms of, of, of the bill that you think are, are particular pieces um, or even maybe since that proposal was introduced, any sort of new developments from from the legislative side? Sure. Well, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus is um, really leading the charge in the House on the immigration bills. And I'm very humbled that President Biden has had asked me to introduce it in the House side and sort of shepherd it through the process here. Um, and CHC is sort of pursuing an all of the above uh, strategy. So um, obviously there are smaller p immigration pieces that we were able to pass in the House with bipartisan support. That was the um, a Dreamer, um, Dream and Promise Act and the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. Now those are just smaller pieces. Those are legalization pieces. They deal with specific groups of immigrants, but the US Citizenship Act is the broad comprehensive bill that would provide the most amount of relief. Uh, it would make all 11 million um, uh, undocumented immigrants who've been living in this country uh, would grant them a path to earn citizenship. So it is uh, the broadest in scope. Uh, and it also seeks to get at, as was mentioned before, root causes of uh, you know the push factors that force people to come to our southern border, um, as well as reforming our legal immigration system, which is uh, hopelessly clogged and there are bottlenecks and choke points along the process that make it a really unworkable system. It's very inhumane because it keeps families apart for many years, sometimes even decades. So it really is a, a very broad bill that provides a tremendous amount of relief and I'm really excited about it. That's great. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And so my question now is, where are we now? Right. You just mentioned uh, Congresswoman Sanchez just mentioned. Let me start with you, Alita. Um, certain portions of, of the bill of the of the comprehensive proposal were passed in the House. Um, what are the prospects of passage of either those sections in the Senate or the whole thing? Sort of what are you hearing? How are, how are the negotiations going so far? Well, the Congresswoman lives in Congress all day long, and so she's the expert here. But, you know, what I'll say is the president is very excited about the United States Citizenship Act, and that is our North Star that this White House is going to continue to fight for because this system is fully broken and requires full reform of all of the pieces that we just discussed. And as you saw the president in his joint address a few weeks ago, 
He talked about how immigration has been far too long litigated with no progress put forward. He wants that to end. And so that includes um, this White House's support of the Dream and Promise Act, which passed with bipartisan vote in the House and the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. Um, and I think, you know, the Senate is in active dialogues. I would um, defer to them and Senate leadership on, on the process thereafter. Uh, but this White House is continuing to uplift um, the full 11 million undocumented because that's who we're fighting for. That includes, um, you know, seeing the secretaries out there. Secretary Cardona held an event with educators with DACA and TPS um, recently. Um, the president himself on Friday met with six um, DACA recipients from rural and urban areas um, that were members of the essential workforce, a doctor, a nurse assistant, an assistant principal, um, and a farm worker. And uh, we will continue to elevate the need for urgent reform while Congress um, does their job and in, in they're the experts on how this process will move forward. But uh, we remain optimistic and this is a, a huge priority of this White House that we will continue to be pushing from all levels that we can. That's great. That's great. So Congresswoman, what are you seeing? What are you hearing over on that side of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue? Sure. So um, we have a, I just feel compelled to add that we have a really unique set of circumstances here. Um, Democrats control the House and the Senate, albeit by, by very thin margins. And for the first time in decades, we have a president and an administration that really wants to get this done, see this come to fruition, and they're willing to put some political muscle behind it and expend some political capital to get it done. So, so number one, it's sort of like the moon, the stars, and the planets are aligning. But in terms of process on the House side, which again, I'm sort of the lead on shepherding the bill through the process, um, because this is a new bill, it's not a bill that's been introduced in prior Congresses and a lot of members didn't know what was in the bill when we introduced it. Um, it's really been a process of educating members about what is and isn't in the bill, um, having discussions with them if there are things that they want to see added or changed. Um, and so that process takes a long time, that, that educating process. And so we've, uh, the CHC has been working very hard to educate our members um, about the bill. And there's a group, and I have to mention this, um, there's a special group of women members, it just happened that they were women, that I call the closers, because in baseball, if it's late in the game and you want to bring home the win, you send in your closers. And so I have a group of some phenomenal members of Congress who have been working tirelessly on this issue. So they have expertise and knowledge and experience. Um, and they've been helping me uh, educate our, the members of our caucus. And we're seeing the number of undecideds move to yes. And that's a very promising, uh, promising development. We, we see the more we educate, the more we get people to yes. So um, we're still doing that educational and outreach um, part component, um, also taking uh, suggestions for improvement of the bill. When we mark the bill up, um, which we are, uh, we're in discussions with Chairman Nadler and the Judiciary Committee to see when in the calendar we can get a date to mark the bill up. We will have an opportunity to make some changes to the bill to improve it. Um, and we expect that the markup will take place in, in the upcoming months. So we're, you know, we're on track. Um, to hopefully get the bill to the floor and passed out of the House before the end of the year. And um, on the Senate side, Senator Menendez has been in, uh, and Senator Schumer, I should say, the two of them, along with um, Senators Cortez Masto and Alex Padilla, they've been pursuing the same thing, discussions with their colleagues and trying to build support for the bill on the Senate side. So uh, I can't really speak in detail about where they are, but I feel like we're in a really good place on the House side. That's great. That's helpful. Well, I know that that you know all of us have our fingers crossed that we can finally, truly get to some meaningful changes you all have laid out uh, for the country, right? For the good of the country. So we're we're looking. This forward is to the that. year, Marco. Marco, this is the year. I am convinced that this is the year that it's going to happen. Well, I know that if you are fully on it, that that it's going to have a better chance than it's ever had before. So thank you for those efforts, Alita. And of course, Congresswoman, you've been leading the charge long before this year, and so thank you for all that you've done to get us to this point for sure. Yeah, I, you know, I tell people I, I've been, served in Congress for 19 years. As long as I've been in Congress, we've been trying to get immigration reform and some relief to immigrant communities. And um, we've worked many, many years. A lot of folks have been 
you know, tilling that soil. Um, and like I said, we have an administration finally that wants to see that come to fruition and is willing to help um, help make that happen. So I'm very, very excited, guardedly optimistic, but very excited. That's great. That's great. Now let me shift gears for a quick minute. Um, and let's talk about what, what you know, inevitably must be addressed or at least di discussed when we talk about uh, immigration, which of course is, is the issue uh, on our southern border, right? The, the, it's something that was uh, significantly in the news a couple of months back. Um, there was real concern that the numbers were growing significantly. Um, I, I personally, I, I think there has not been as much coverage since, and I'm hearing indirectly that there's been some progress and that simply hasn't got as much coverage. So I wanted to give you a chance and maybe again, start with you, Alita, on behalf of the administration. Tell us a little bit about sort of how you all see the, the, the situation uh, there on the ground now. What kind of progress has been made? What is it our community should know, again, that may not be getting the kind of coverage that it deserves? And I'm sure there's still a need, so please do speak to that, of course, but, but tell us sort of where things stand today, because I, oftentimes I feel like the last people heard was something that's already a month or two months uh, uh, back. I'm so glad you asked this question um, because I think um, no one more than our community truly knows what the last four years um, left behind. The devastation for border communities, the devastation of the asylum system, and just the overall attack on the immigration system that was already broken at large. Uh, hundreds of actions of policy change were made by the prior administration to cut immigration and no place more acute than along the southern border in the asylum system. And so it's really important for folks to understand that what this administration inherited was a devastated, gutted agency that did not have the systems in place to truly account for uh, the increase um, in unaccompanied children in order to safely process them as quickly as possible. And so what we saw in the news media over the last couple of months where you saw facilities where it was just overcrowded, um, this administration was very clear that border patrol facilities is no place for a child to be. And there are um, legal obligations to ensure that children are not in border patrol facilities longer than 72 hours. Um, and I'm happy to report that as of now, that number is, um, we had children in March 28th in Border Patrol facilities um, up to 133 hours on average, and now that's down to 30. Um, additionally, um, in March 28th, there were about 57, a little over 5,700 children in Border Patrol custody, and as of today, that is 869. Um, and what this administration did was put forth a whole government approach to quickly prop up emergency intake facilities that thankfully to regions like the Congresswoman in Southern California, in places like Long Beach and Pomona and San Diego, where, you know, quite frankly, you have a lot of Latino elected officials who have the welcoming spirit and understand that these children need a temporary home as this administration quickly works to reunite them with their families. And so in communities across America with local mayors, county officials, faith leaders, service providers, um, these sites have quickly propped up to put children, um, get children out of Border Patrol safely into these facilities as the administration works to quickly reunite them with their families and sponsors. But additionally, we've done the work, for example, um, the last administration made it harder for undocumented sponsors of um, unaccompanied children to come forth um, without fear to be reunited and rules that were prohibiting that access have been changed by this administration. So we've been doing what we can to um, increase the efficiencies um, and decrease the fear to expedite family reunification. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that is a progress on the border that isn't often talked about is that for two years um, leading up until inauguration day, um, the Remain in Mexico program was in place by the Trump administration, where tens of thousands of families were left to languish in Mexico, like the camp in Matamoros. And so um, this administration has been putting forth a safe and orderly processing to make right by those families who have been stuck in Mexico, who were lawfully seeking asylum in the United States. And over 10,000 people in that program have already been processed um, safely. They've been COVID tested and re-entered into the United States to pursue their asylum claims here. Um, and the camp in Matamoros um, 
all of those individuals have come forward as well. And so there's still a lot of work to do to undo the harm. Um, but as you saw with the families um, that were recently reunited and those hugs that were all across the TV screen, um, that might be one family, but to that family, those hugs are the world. And I hope that those are images of also the moral change that has happened over the recent months that are signs of the progress to come. We need more hugs with more families being reunited. Um, and that's just some of the progress. And I know the Congresswoman was grace, gracious enough to recently travel down to the Donna facility um, with Secretary Mayorkas. So I'm sure she has um, a lot of um, sort of great insights to share from that on the ground and experience. Yes, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so not only did I travel to Donna just two weeks ago with um, DHS Secretary Mayorkas, but about a month prior to that, I had gone to um, the facilities in El Paso with Congresswoman Escobar. Um, and the difference uh, in just a month was tremendous. So um, we know that the border intake facilities are were never meant to house children, but because of the numbers um, and the um, just the the havoc that the Trump administration wrecked in in terms of dismantling the whole um, system, you know, you're not going to fix four years of of you know destruction in four months. So. Um, in the prior visit to El Paso, we had large numbers of children that we saw, although they were in much better shape than under the Trump administration because they had clean clothing, they had access to showers, they had, had meals, but there was um, a, a large number of them. Uh, the Biden administration has worked around the clock to process children as safely, humanely, and quickly as they can in line with our immigration laws because we can't just release them. We have to make sure that the people that are coming to get them, their sponsors, you know, they have background checks and that these are the people who, who uh, you know, who are responsible for these children. But the number of unaccompanied children being held by Border Patrol has plummeted by 90% since late March. Um, HHS has been working to um, create uh, appropriate uh, housing for these children. Uh, that They, you know, have these temporary intake sites um, to house the children that have enrichment and schooling until they can be reunited with their parents or sponsors. Um, and these kids are tested, um, they're quarantined if they, if they um, you know, have been in contact with COVID um, and then they're released to their sponsors as soon as they can, as soon as they can process um, the sponsors. So um, while we had seen um, children at one time spending an average of 130 hours in the CBP facilities, um, they're now processed and out in on average 20 hours. So one day turnaround, which is is significant progress. I mean, don't underestimate what great progress that is um, to go from that number of hours uh, down to just about a day. Um, and it and, and bears sort of repeating that many of these children, it's like 90% of these kids have a parent or, or other relative living in the United States who can who is their sponsor. And um, if we hadn't seen the restrictions on legal immigration, like choke down the legal pathways for their parents and sponsors to become citizens, these children could have been sponsored through the family petition system. But, but because the Trump administration, you know, kept restricting even the legal channels, um, that's what has create, created all this pent up demand. So the Biden administration doing just an outstanding job of, of trying to process these kids quickly. And again, with something like the US Citizenship Act, if you can legalize you know, the parents that have been living and working here, um, then these kids can come through legal channels and they don't have to make a dangerous journey north with coyotes or come unaccompanied and, you know, um, be exposed to, you know, all kinds of danger on the journey north. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate that update because as, as I mentioned, it's it's not shared nearly enough. And and I want to note and, and thank you both for, for mentioning that um, it's worth noting that uh, it seems like all of our leaders are really uh, lending all of their efforts. And I think we, we are particularly fortunate that we have Secretary Mayorkas heading up DHS and we have Secretary Becerra former CHC and CHCI chairman, uh, now Secretary Becerra, leading HHS and also directing all of their efforts and their resources to this. And uh, as you even mentioned, Alita, Secretary Cardona, right, who's speaking to dreamers and thinking about the, the educational impact of immigration. So we're really grateful for all that. And, and I, I do want to mention that um, 
I personally, obviously, am following this issue, but I've, I'm fortunate enough, in fact, that next week I'm going to be joining a delegation led by my good friend, Tony Tijerino of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, coordinated with the Luther Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services down to McAllen, Texas. We're going to visit with Sister Norma Pimentel and the, the Humanitarian Respite Center. So we're going to see firsthand ourselves um, and meet some of these young people and at least if, if, help raise awareness about the, the, the situation for the young people and, and just offer our own support, both moral and physical to them, right? And seeing what we can do. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to that, to being able to lend my own efforts personally, which leads me to my final question as we get ready to wrap up here, which is what would you all recommend to folks watching this briefing that they can do? What is it individuals throughout the country and our community can do to raise voices, to bring more awareness to this issue, to lend their own efforts in some way to help uh, these young people, right? These children, these families, these individuals, not only the children, right? The parents as well, many of whom are in, in really tough situations, but who need all of our help, not to mention on a practical standpoint, not to mention to, to bring about policy change, right? What are the efforts you would advise folks watching to, to, to take part in themselves? Um, of you so I'll started. just say that, you know, um, sorry, I'm going to jump in here. Yeah. You know, our yes. immigrant family members and loved ones have shown a great resiliency despite the fear and the uncertainty that they face. And so we have to carry that same spirit as we fight for a path for citizenship and other reforms to our immigration system. So I encourage everybody to stay engaged. You know, you may think it's cheesy or, or doesn't work, but calling, writing, emailing your members of Congress, your senators, mobilizing students, uh, your neighbors, your family members to do the same, raise awareness in your communities, keep your foot on the gas. We, the, it's gotta be maximum, uh, you know, pressure and the loudest voice possible to really push um, this boulder up the hill. Uh, because the federal legislative process can be painfully slow, but we can't let it dissuade us from keeping the pressure and the drumbeat on for Congress to finally act. I mean, it's been more than 35 years since we last revised our immigration laws. People have waited for too long. The status quo and doing nothing, that's not sustainable. This is it. This is the year we got to get it done. We need everybody pushing, everybody rowing in the same direction, um, you know, being vocal and not taking no for an answer. Thank you so much. And Alita, any final words? Um, I, echo, I echo everything the Congresswoman would say. I said, I, I think, um, you know, you had mentioned Sister Norma. And one thing that I want to be clear is that um, the Biden-Harris administration can only move forward these efforts in deep partnership with the NGO community, the faith-based community, state and local elected officials, members of Congress. A lot of harm was done to the immigration system over the prior administration. And that means we need to be a dedicated team that has a lot of energy for a lot of fights ahead. Um, whether that be in Congress, whether that be restoring humane and orderly processing around that border, around the border, whether it be continuing to roll back a lot of the bad policies over time, um, whether it be schools being um, safe places for undocumented youth um, to explore their futures and passions. There's so much to do in our local communities. And so I would encourage folks to figure out who serves and organizes immigrants down the street from where you live and how do you find a bit of an immigration organizing home? because there are so many fights ahead and we need you for all of them. And usually those local folks um, are engaged in multiple efforts that can find ways to explore your talents. And so I would I would start there, but stay committed because we have a lot of work to do um, and we're not gonna stop until we fully fix it all. So really appreciate this conversation. Well, thank you both. I, I wanna thank both of you, Congresswoman Sanchez and Alita Garcia. Uh, both folks I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have known for a little while now, and I know firsthand uh, you are fierce, fierce advocates, not only for the Latino community, not only for the immigrant community, but really for the nation. And so I want to thank you both for the hard work you're doing and, and continuing to carry this forward. Um, and Congresswoman Sanchez, we wish you all the luck in closing, as you said, being a New Yorker, we hope that you are all channeling your inner Mariano Rivera's to make sure it is all but guaranteed that it happens. Um, and Alita, again, thank you so much for the work you're doing. We're, we're, we're grateful to have you there at the administration with the ear of, of the nation's leadership there on the on the executive side, continuing to push forward for our community. So so thank you so much both for being with us today uh, and we'll, we'll let you go. So good to see you. 
uh, and then I'll wrap up in just a sec. Any final words of, uh, of farewell for, for the audience? No, just thank you for the interest in you know getting the information out there to, to our community. Great. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today on this immigration briefing. Please continue to follow the conversation, share your thoughts and comments. You can uh, join us on social media, for example, on Twitter. You can use the hashtag uh, CHCI Summit. Uh, we'll be having conversations about this and about all of the other issues uh, continuing in our summit today. Uh, in fact, up next, we have two breakout sessions, one on the role of online platforms in content moderation and another on the role of the Latino workforce in the recovery, two absolutely critical issues that are affecting not only the Latino community, but really the nation overall. So please continue to stay tuned. We'll see you there. Have a great day. And as always, everyone, please stay safe and healthy.